Welcome back for our second week of our Ask the Vet segment, a chance for you to email us your questions, what you would like answered about your pet maybe. Joining us today is Dr. John Font. He's the medical director of the Firehouse Animal Health Center, and we got a great response last week. Um, so we're going to get to some of those questions. But first, if you could introduce us to your friend. This is Walter. Walter was a, a rescue dog that um, got a new owner about a year ago and ended up with um, kennel cough pretty shortly after getting out of the shelter environment and actually yeah. got really sick with that. So we, um, he's all well now, but we decided to bring him on the show. And for those of you uh, that are adopting a, a pet from an animal center, I, I assume kennel cough is pretty common. It is. It's a really contagious thing. And mm -hmm. kennel cough is kind of a big syndrome that really includes a lot of different elements to it that can cause this contagious cough. Mm -hmm. Some are bacteria, some are viruses, and so it's um, usually a relatively self-limiting thing and they get over it quickly, but Walter was kind of one of the exceptions to that rule that got really sick. Well, while we're talking about um, stray dogs, a timely question came in to us, and it's what are the dangers of uh, stray animals and pets that they have to extreme cold like we've been experiencing lately? Yeah, obviously not much of an issue in Austin with uh, with most of our pets, but with the cold wet weathers we're seeing, uh, you know, frostbite, things like that have been have been a bigger issue. And, sure. And, um, you know, I think we just have to be cautious about not leaving them out in the cold too uh, too long and make sure they have warm shelter to, to get away from the elements. Absolutely. Uh, this question came from one of our viewers, Will, and he asked, uh, my vet told me that my dog has a staph infection. Should I worry about that being contagious? You know, I think the word staph infection gets thrown around a lot, and in human medicine, that's a really scary thing because um, MRSA or MRSA, the methicillin-resistant type staph that people deal with, is mm -hmm. a potentially contagious thing. In dogs, the normal bacteria that lives on the skin of dogs is a type of staph bacteria, and it's not contagious to people. So most of the typical skin infections we deal with in dogs, we refer to as some sort of staph infection, mm -hmm. not contagious to any other pets or, or to people. And it sounds like Walter, uh, he, mm -hmm. is, he is part terrier, it yes. sounds like, so it, I think he, he may want to play, although he's, he's yawning <laughs> he's right now. Get out of here. Um, another question, this one is about a cat, it comes from one of our viewers, Sandy, and it asks, um, her cat has a black debris always on his chin, mm -hmm. what exactly is that? That's actually a pretty common thing that we see with some cats, and it's um, the black debris is usually a, a keratinization, and so cats actually get um, what we call as feline chin acne, and it huh. really is kind of like acne in people. It's the pores there get clogged with this keratin debris, and they get almost these blackheads. They can actually get infected and irritated, and cats are meticulous groomers, so they usually do a good job of cleaning themselves, but right. it's a really tough spot for them to get. Yeah. So there are some things that we can do to try to kind of uh, prevent that from happening and also treat it, uh, just kind of help them keep that area clean. Interesting. Cat acne. Mm -hmm. Never heard of that before. Well, if you have questions that you would like us to ask the vet, you can always email them to us at askthevet at kxan.com. We will try to get them on with Dr. John Fott again from the Firehouse Animal Health Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Walter, good to meet you. Thanks for having us. All right. Welcome back. It is time to Ask the Vet, a chance for you to learn more about caring for your family pet and send in your questions so that we can get some of the answers for you right here on our show. Joining us once again is Dr. John Fott from the Firehouse Animal Health Center here in Austin. Thanks for being here once again. Thanks for having me. Uh, you brought in another, another dog with you this week, and this one is, is pretty special. Who is this? Yeah, this is Mabel, and Mabel was uh, adopted from Austin Boxer Rescue a little mm -hmm. over a year ago. Um, she had heartworms that we, she had actually gone into heart failure yeah. and we ended up having to treat both the heart failure and the heartworms and um, she's actually doing really well now, which is great. Very close, uh, obviously could easily lead to death. You were able to treat it. Um, right. She's about how old now? Hi. She is about six or seven, we think, but she, we don't really know much about her, her past history, so mm -hmm. it, it was an adoption situation that uh, we think she's about six years old. She is obviously a sweetheart, um, but let's talk a little bit about heartworms uh, because it can be deadly. I guess it depends on when you catch it. Sure. You know, we routinely are trying to screen for heartworms um, on annual checkups because the earlier you catch those things, the better your success rate is, is treating them and keeping them from having problems. Mm -hmm. In her case, she'd already gone into heart failure, so we had to treat both the heart failure, and we're still treating that to this day because the damage was already there. But with right. general heartworm cases, 
We do. We try to uh, we try to catch them early so we can treat them early and have better outcomes. How do dogs contract heartworms? Heartworms are typically they they're acquired. Uh, they're an actual worm that lives in the heart. They're acquired uh -huh. from mosquito bites. Okay. So mosquitoes bite infected dogs, pick up the immature larva, and then they go and bite an uninfected dog and mm -hmm. inject that when they take a blood meal. Obviously, it is treatable if you catch it at the right time, but prevention is always the best route to go. Prevention is the easiest way to, to keep from having an issue. And, you know, here in Texas, we, we have a lot of mosquitoes, and so we have a lot of heartworm disease. Mm -hmm. And so year-round heartworm prevention is really a, um, a smart thing to do because it's a lot easier than the treatment process. So it is not contagious from one dog to another? It not is, without the mosquito. Not without the mosquito, exactly. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the, the Boxer, uh, Boxer Rescue Organization. Is, is that your health center this week? We're actually having, a, having an event this Saturday um, from 1230 to 230. We're actually having Austin Boxer Rescue come in. Mm -hmm. And we're, gonna, we're actually having a, a board-certified veterinary cardiologist come in and talk about heart disease in, in the breed and heartworm disease and, and things like that. So it should be a fun event open to whoever wants to come. For pet owners at home, how often should they get their dogs checked for heartworms? We generally do it annually at an annual visit just yeah. to kind of make sure that everything's good. If for some reason they've been off prevention for some time, there may be a reason to do it more often than that. Certainly. Well, we wish the best for uh, Mabel. She certainly seems like she's doing well. And um, again, she's just a sweetheart. So we're glad to see that she is recovering nicely. Thank you so much once again for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Dr. John fought with the Firehouse Animal Health Center here in Austin. It is our Ask the Vet segment. If you want to send us your questions, send them in to askthevet at kxan.com. We'll be right back. To keep your dog feeling like a champion, each week we like to Ask the Vet, a segment dedicated to your pet's needs with answers to your questions. And joining us once again is Dr. John Fott from the Firehouse Animal Health Center right here in Austin. Thank you so much for being here once again. Thanks for having me. And you always bring a friend. Yes. So who did you bring today? This is actually my personal dog. This is Gage. Oh, he's, okay. uh, he's turning 13, so I thought it would be a good good thing to talk about some arthritis stuff because he's been slowing down a little bit. He, he's a little camera shy right now. Yeah. This he may does. be uh, his first time on camera. So 13 years old, he, he's lived a pretty long life. He's done really well. He's done really well. Um, so we're talking today a little bit about arthritis and how that can set in, especially in, in older dogs. Sure. Yeah. The, you know, we're seeing more age-related ailments with dogs because they're, well, and cats too, because they're living longer lives. We're taking better care of them. Yeah. So we're having to deal with a lot of the things that come with age and arthritis is one of those things we're seeing a lot. At what time do you kind of see it start to set in and, and where do you start to see it set in? It can, you know, typically what we see is dogs have and, and cats have more trouble kind of getting up and moving. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times it's kind of their hips that are the, the areas that it shows up first, but mm -hmm. it can affect any joint. Arthritis is a disease of the joint, so it can affect a lot of different joints. The hips are the ones that we tend to see most commonly. Age-wise, it really that ranges the spectrum. We see some dogs that don't have any real issues until they're way later, and then some, for whatever reason, they start having some uh, some issues with arthritis earlier in life. So as an owner, best things to look out for, kind of trouble getting up and down, as you mentioned? Yeah, I think if you if you notice that your pets are doing things a little slower than they used to, some I think we naturally want to say, yeah, they're just getting older, but sometimes there, there are, that part of getting older creates some arthritis, things that we can do something about and, and turn the clock back a little bit for them. Is there anything preventative you can do ahead of time and then what are some treatment options once you notice that they have that? Sure, from a prevention standpoint, keeping them in a good healthy weight and not letting them get overweight is, is really advantageous. Uh -huh. The other things, natural things like glucosamine, chondroitin, all those things are, are, are helpful in the early stages. Once they have arthritis and have pain and discomfort, there's a whole slew of new things, uh, medications, anti-inflammatories, um, other types of pain medications. There's things that create, um, that create extra synovial fluid to help to lubricate their joints. Um, stem cell transplants, acupuncture, all those things are being done now. And you mentioned it also, you could see it in, in cats, similar symptoms? Sure. I mean, I think realistically, any aging mammal, we, we actually treat arthritis in horses and cows and cats. I mean, I think that it's a, it's definitely a, um, 
A growing trend with aging animals. Wonderful. Now, you, um, speaking of animals, we have a few that are about <laughs> to walk on our set here. It looks like the penguins may have uh, wandered off from the SeaWorld exhibit in the other side of our studio. Uh, so, hey guys, Looking what's going for a place on? to go. Yeah, so that we took uh, Gage away so that he <laughs> didn't go crazy when the penguins walked across the stage. But um, have you seen any of the arthritis symptoms in Gage? You know, he's been slowing down a little bit, and we started him on, on glucosamine a while back, and he's actually done really well, but um, I haven't gotten to a point where I've had to put him on any other medications. We tried to keep him keep him healthy and, and good so that I don't have to get to that point. Yeah, 13 years. I don't know what the average lifespan is, but that's yeah. that seems like a pretty long life. He's he's doing well. Well, every day is a blessing, so we'll keep going. Well, we'd love to hear um, some of your questions, if you have any, um, for our Ask the Vet, Vet segment. Dr. John Fott, um, just email them to us at Ask the Vet at kxan.com. Thank you so much for being here once yeah, again. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll be right back with some penguins. Welcome back. It is time for our Ask the Vet segment, where every week we ask some of the questions that you may have to better care for your family pet. And joining us once again is Dr. John Fott from the Firehouse Animal Health Center in West Austin. Thank you for being here today. Thanks, honey. And you brought a, uh, a kitten with you this time. Um, introduce us. So this is what we've been calling this cat Squint because uh, there's an eye issue that needs to be sorted out, but the cat actually showed up. Um, on a client of our doorstep a couple of days ago, and mm -hmm. we've, we've been trying to kind of help find a home for it. And how, how old do you uh, figure Squints is? I think she's about five months old, if we had to guess, so that's what it looks like. So uh, she just showed up on your doorstep. Um, could you tell if she was cared for? Had she been in a fight? She, she has an eye issue, which I suspect is a congenital thing, because she doesn't have any real other trauma that mm -hmm. goes along with that. Um, and so she didn't seem to be shy around people. She ran right into our client's home and jumped on the couch. And so yeah. I, uh, she's been a really sweet cat, and we're just trying to find a good home for her. So. She just needs a forever home. Mm -hmm. um, certainly she's been sweet since she's been here. <laughs> well, let's talk about you know, when you find abandoned animals, cats maybe specifically, what should you do? Well, I think that the first thing we would recommend is just being cautious because a lot of them aren't as sweet as this one, and they're scared and nervous and can act out and... and if we don't know their health status, we always are a little bit guarded about things like rabies and that kind of stuff. So I, um, I caution people to be, be careful from that point going forward. Mm -hmm. If Once you have them, we want to try to find if they have a, an owner or so, looking for collars, tags, see if they're microchipped. Microchips um, can't be read by an individual, but at a vet clinic or, or the shelter can help with that. When, so. you, when you talk about um, health issues that, that um, an an animal may have, what are we talking about? Well, with kittens, we're usually talking about, I mean, a lot of times they come in with upper respiratory viruses, um, sometimes internal parasites. They may be having vomiting or diarrhea. Mm -hmm. the, um, the other things we classically look for are things like leukemia and FIV, which can be acquired from their mother at birth. For those that are looking to um, adopt a pet um, or if, if they find an abandoned animal, a cat maybe, how do you introduce them to your household if you have kids, if you have um, existing pets? Yeah, we try to go slow with that. We want to make sure that I, a lot of times with cats especially, we, we have people go kind of a, a small room first for a little bit, kind of open up the house gradually. Uh -huh. If you have other, um, if you have babies or other animals, sometimes it's good to transfer bedding like a, a blanket or mm. a towel or something so that they can kind of get used to those smells and odors before they just get thrown all into the same environment together. Absolutely interesting. And, uh, you know, cats and dogs can mix, I guess, in the right environment. Sure. Yeah, they, yeah. Don't, they don't always fight. They don't always, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, there, there are a lot of them that get along just fine. So for squints, what all needs to be done to get her ready for adoption? Well, we're going to try to get her vaccines and everything taken care of, and, and really we're just trying to find the right home um, and the right fit so that we can, and we'll go through the process of getting her caught up with everything that she needs. And the microchip, what, just goes right under her skin, is that right? Yeah, that's a, the microchips are a great thing because a lot of, a lot of pets find homes that way. Had uh -huh. she been microchipped at this point, we'd be able to Probably call be and able to find the owner. But right. the, um, the, the challenge is that 
if that ne is never done, then you never really get uh, get them linked up the way they should. Absolutely. Squints, we hope to uh, find you a forever home. You can always um, contact us here at KXAN, or you can contact Dr. John Fott. He's at the Firehouse Animal Health Center in West Austin. Thank you so much once again for being here. If you have a question that you'd like us to ask the vet, you can send it to askthevet at kxan.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back this afternoon. It is time to ask the vet. Dr. John Fott is here from the Firehouse Animal Health Center right here in Austin to answer some questions that you may have about caring for your own pet at home. And um, thank you so much for being here once again. Thanks for having me. You brought a friend with you. Introduce us. Yes, this is Weta. She's a nine-year-old golden retriever that is a client's dog and, and uh, was in the clinic today and wanted to come with us. So. There you go. Yeah, making her television debut. Now, she's just in for an annual checkup. Correct. Um, nothing out of the ordinary, really, but just kind of reiterating the importance of getting that annual checkup. Sure. Yeah, we do. Uh, we generally recommend a wellness exam annually with pets, and mm -hmm. she's here for hers and seems to be doing really well, but she's... Uh, she was a little overweight before, but we've, we've uh, gone on a weight loss plan and okay. she's doing great. <laughs> she's on a diet. And she's nine years old, so she's getting into her golden years a little bit. Correct. All right. Uh, we do have a question from one of our viewers that we wanted to ask you. Uh, this is from Charlie, and his question is, he has a two-year-old American Eskimo that's been chewing and pulling on a toenail on the inside of her leg. It's the claw a couple inches up from her paw. That's the dew claw. Correct. And uh, she's been chewing on that, that one particular claw for a couple weeks. What's your advice to him? If it's just the one claw and the dew claw being the one that's not really a weight-bearing digit, usually what happens is that there's some sort of trauma or either the nail gets split or torn or sometimes there's even an uh, infection that can occur at the, at the uh, base of the nail. Uh -huh. If dogs are chewing at multiple nails, then we think about other things like allergies or something going on. But if it's just one nail, my yeah. guess is there's something going on with that claw, whether trauma or infectious that may be the cause. Yeah, best to get that one particular nail checked out. Yeah, if it's been going on as long as it has, it may be worth checking out because if there's an infection, and especially from licking and that kind of thing, it'd be right. an, an error for that to per persist. Okay. Of course, spring is right around the corner, and we know that can bring out the fleas. Correct. Uh, when does that season officially really get going? You know, we get this question all the time, and there's not really a flea season. Okay. And we know that humidity and temperature affect when fleas hatch. So you tend to see more in the springtime and that kind of time. But the reality is that fleas, the adult fleas live on their pets. Mm -hmm. And when it gets cold outside, the pets come inside and so do the fleas and they, they tend to live just fine. How do you know if your pet has fleas? What are the signs to look for? Well, I think we always think of the itchy dog as the dog with fleas. And right. in Austin, we see a lot of dogs that are itchy for reasons other than fleas, like allergies sure. and things like that. Right. The, we also assume that if they're not itching they don't have fleas but that's not necessarily true either okay. so we see both uh, we see dogs that come in and they're itching and we look for fleas and you want to try to get down to the base of the hair right. We tend to look around the base of the tail and mm -hmm. on the belly where there's less hair and you can see little black things they are visible but mm -hmm. they're they're small right and uh, you can actually use a little flea comb to help find them and we're seeing some video of that uh, right there they also jump around <laughs> what uh, makes them so difficult to get rid of well, they're, they're hardy little creatures, to be honest. I mean, they are, um, you know, I was doing some flea research. We were talking about how fleas can jump 150 times their, their height. Size so their height, yeah. it'd be like a human jumping over buildings. They can eat 15 times their weight every day in a meal. Wow. And they lay 20 and 30 eggs a day. And that's mm -hmm. the real problem for getting rid of them is that they are reproducing so fast mm -hmm. that um, unless you're using long-term products, mm -hmm. you're, we, we've really got to cover for more than just that one flea that we see at a time. So where do you start to get rid of them? We usually, you know, when I was growing up, we had a lot more environmental control because there weren't very many good products available, so you had to do a lot more bombing the house, spraying the yard, doing that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. Now we have such great products, whether they're shampoos or topicals or oral flea prevention products. And so yeah. we generally recommend people find good products to use with the pets, mm -hmm. and then you don't have to do nearly as much environmental control. And is it a, is it a, a uh, one-time thing, or do you have to kind of work at it over time to get rid of them? Most of these, uh, most of these products work really well, but they, they will kill the 
the fleas that are on the pet immediately, mm -hmm. but then they're going to help prevent the new ones from coming. So as that cycle cycles through, you generally get rid of them over time. So we generally recommend that they be on some sort of prevention on a monthly basis. Tips for flea pre prevention for your pet. Dr. Font, thank you so much for joining us once thank again. You. If you have a question that you would like us to ask the vet, you can send us your question to askthevet at kxan.com. Thank you so much for being here once again. Thank you. All right. sure. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It is time to Ask the Vet, where we answer some of the questions that you may have regarding your family pet. Joining me once again is Dr. John Fott from the Firehouse Animal Health Center here in West Austin. Thank you for being here once again. Thanks for having me. Who did you bring with you? This is Addy. Addy. Yeah, and Addy is uh, recept one of my receptionist dogs. Okay. And, uh, she uh, she wanted to come on air today. So. She looks like a people lover. She is. She she's a great dog. And how old is she? She's about four now, and so. Yeah. Uh, so. Kind of fair skin, and as the spring season comes around, the sun starts to come out a little bit more. Interesting, you can actually put sunscreen on dogs. That's correct. We um, some dogs, not many dogs need sunscreen, but mm -hmm. dogs like this, she's got a really thin coat, and she's her skin's really exposed on her nose and ears, and so right. as spring comes on, we worry more about sunburn, and and some dogs can can actually use sunscreen. Yeah, so that that's a thing that they actually need. Not only can you do it, but they need it. Correct. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, what other, you know, dogs do you recommend? Is it just their ears and their nose? What do you need to look out for? Really the short, short haired areas. Some dogs you'll see that lay on their belly all day. If their belly doesn't have any hair on it, then they can get sunburn. Mm -hmm. If the dogs are getting sunburn, we want to try to use a sunscreen and we want to try to use something that's safe for the dog. So we try to uh, steer people kind of towards the children's sunscreens for people. There's actually some dog sunscreens available, but children's sunscreen works just fine too. Anything to watch out for as far as sun exposure? Well, as far as the sun exposure, you can actually, they can develop little melanomas just like, uh, just like in people. So uh -huh. there's, there are sometimes we see that in dogs. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the sunscreens, we do want to be cautious about certain products that have zinc oxide in them. Zinc can actually be detrimental to dogs. Oh, so okay. they can actually cause red blood cell destruction if they ingest it. So we, that's why we try to find a safe product for and, them. And, and go with the kids. Um, sunscreen products is that that's what probably you the recommend? best way or just try to find something that doesn't have zinc oxide but most of the children's don't so they if they ingest it it's not gonna be a big deal for them either well we like to uh, take some questions from our viewers and last week we were talking about some um, flea products and how important flea prevention was especially again with spring coming back around maybe the fleas are a little bit more active um, one one of our viewers wants to know if you should change flea products periodically yeah that's an interesting question and one that comes up periodically it's a uh, you know, we know that when you talk about livestock that have intestinal parasites, they they need to change products routinely because they'll develop resistance if they don't. Mm -hmm. We don't really do that with fleas as much. The, there's a lot of products available, um, but most of the products work really well, and resistance is something that j just now is kind of being talked about as far as fleas go. I believe there probably are pockets where there is some of that, but there's not. Uh, it's not a huge issue at this time. So I usually tell people if the products aren't working, just find something different, work with your veterinarian to figure out a good product going forward, but I don't think you necessarily have to be rotating them all the time. Whatever works for your dog. Correct. Um, another viewer wants to ask, kind of a separate topic, um, current options for separation anxiety. I know a lot of dogs get very attached to their to their owners. That's right. Separation anxiety and true separation anxiety is actually a, a much more rare thing than, than people, I, I guess, than we talk about. When we talk about dogs that get excited when you leave or they're whining when you leave or whatever, that's not really true separation anxiety. True separation anxiety is when they can't stand to be away for a moment and it never dissipates and goes away until the owner returns. Maybe so, they don't eat, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're lethargic. Des destructive, they'll tear the house apart. Right. And so occasionally we see cases like that where it really is a, a big deal. And so there are a lot of options available for that. There's there's some very natural things um, that decrease stress, like there's some dog appeasing pheromone collars, there's hmm. the thunder shirts people talk about yeah, that wrap the dogs that. up. Right. Most of that, though, is um, there's a lot of training and a lot of desensitization that goes into that. And, and in extreme cases, uh, we'll use medication sometimes, even things like Prozac, which are kind of bizarre for people to use. But, yeah. uh, but those can be helpful in, in some of those separation anxiety cases. Dr. John Fott from the Firehouse Animal Health Center in West Austin, thank you so much for yeah. being here once again. Addie, good to meet you. I love the patch on her eye. I know. So She's cute. cute. All right, thank you.